Look, I get the it's the back of the only pass building. What is it with trespass? Where's all the tents trespass? Loads of tents here, look. Look at this. They're everywhere. Right up a line. Look at this. We've no room in here, country. We need to send all these people home. This is unbelievable. What? Look at this. All the tents over there. Kills of people, look. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Look at this. Trespass must be making fire to selling all these tents to the government. Leave no room in their country. We need to send all these people home. This is madness. Pure madness. I believe in mass deportations and you should too. We have our own homeless Irish people. And now we have 10 C at the back of Ipass again. I feel very threatened. I'm afraid to go out on my own. My sons won't let me go out on my own. Ireland's anti-immigration backlash has spiralled into countrywide unrest in recent months. After a sharp rise in the number of foreigners arriving onto its shores. Unfortunately, I think Ireland is becoming the new Sweden. Protests, arson attacks and hardening anti-immigration views have transfused Irish politics with a fervour not seen since the Troubles. How long are you going to stay out here for? As long as it takes. My name's Michael Murphy and I went to Ireland for The Telegraph to find out what Irish people make of the growing strife. I started my journey in Dublin, where hundreds of people turned out for an anti-immigration march. We're just fed up with the Irish government. We're just fed up with them. It's like a mass plantation, what they're doing here. There's so many unvetted male people being brought over to this country. And they're planting them all in around schools, parks, and we're all feeling very unsafe. We're, we're worried for our children. We cannot sustain a huge number, that, that level of, of, of foreign people living in the, within the borders of this country, many of which are living off social welfare because they're being, because they're being attracted here because of the uh, loose welfare laws and immigration laws of the state. Look after the Irish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Look after the Irish. Just messing around with our heads, this whole government, and I don't trust what's going on. I just want our, our I, I think they're puppets for other powers, the elites, you know, the who and, you know, all the rest of it, and possibly even King Charles, just uh, puppets for somebody else, and they're not caring for the own, our own people. But the Irish and the long-term homeless here from all over the world are living and sleeping in the streets. The council come and take their, their tents and burn their goods or dump them. And these people are on a housing list 20 and 30 years. But if you come in here off a plane with no passport, uh, you're safe. It's just not right, so there. Call, and to anyone listening to this, call me what the hell you like. Little do I care. Thank you. Some people have described marches like this as far right. Uh, are you far right? No, I am a concerned father. I have three children, I have two daughters and I have a son. 11, nine and seven. That's why I'm here. I, uh, listen, the mainstream media don't report on what goes on really in these areas. There's kids being abducted, there's kids being assaulted, there's kids being raped, there's women being raped, and the mainstream media will not report on it. To find out more about where the anger is coming from, I went to a traditional Irish pub in the heart of Dublin to sit down with dissident journalist Ben Scallon. The issue of immigration didn't really come up much in Irish politics. I think we're probably unique in the sense that it's been a major election issue in the UK, in Germany, in America, but across the Western world, while this conversation was unfolding, Irish people haven't really discussed it at election time. And then now, I think around 2019 or 2018, that sort of time period, we saw the beginnings of protests uh, uh, around asylum centres being moved into local areas. And I think that's simply due to a, a significant uptick that we were seeing, where it was, it was far bigger numbers than what we had experienced previously. And why do you think the government has made Ireland's borders more porous and has, as you said, run, rung the dinner bell for um, you know, asylum seekers and other migrants around the world? 
I think that the Irish government is primarily concerned with appearing to be a modern European country and they admire their European colleagues, they admire countries like uh, Scandinavian countries like Sweden and so on that are progressive and very uh, uh, trendy, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. Unfortunately, I think Ireland is becoming the new Sweden in a way because the same way people used to talk about Sweden several years ago, that it was this country that was totally off the rails, they've got total strife, total ghettoization. It seems like we want, having seen the failure of that policy in countries like Sweden and in countries like Germany and France, we want to replicate it for some reason that I don't quite understand. The Irish government has bused refugees, often at night and with little warning, into towns like Roscrae, sparking local anger and weeks-long demonstrations. I went to Roscrae, where locals have been protesting for three weeks outside the town's only hotel, closed down last month after the government struck a deal with its owner to house more than 160 asylum seekers there. I am out here, first of all, I'm a mother, um, and I'm very, very concerned about the level of migration that's happening into our town. We are one of the smallest towns in Tipperary, and we have 85% of international protection applicants. That's a huge number for any town, but for a small town like Grey that doesn't have any resources, we have over a thousand IPAs in town. There's only five and a half thousand of a population in this town. That's a huge amount to expect anybody to take on. Some people have said that um, the town has changed um, over the last few years. They're yeah, scared massively. to go out at night. Um, the uh, playground is left um, yeah. without children. No, yeah. no people want to go there anymore. Why is that? Well, I think a lot of the thing is, and here again, it's the arrogance of the, of the men that are bringing them into the town. They don't provide any services for them. There's no recreational activities. So you have groups of 10 and 15 IPAs standing around in groups. Now, let it be said, if that was 10 or 15 Irish men standing around in groups, I would be intimidated. But you're, when you're walking past a group of men and they're saying something to you in a different language and you don't know what they're saying, it's obviously, it's very, very intimidating. There's women, older women and men here who won't go to collect their pension on a Friday morning in town because the post office, outside the post office is where they gather. Now, I'm not saying these men could be, you know, they're probably really, really nice lads, but any group that gathers in 15s and 20s is going to be intimidating. While the protests have been mostly peaceful, some have turned violent, including in Dublin last year, where riots broke out after three young children and a woman was stabbed, allegedly by a man of Algerian origin. We're here in Crooksling, on the outskirts of Dublin, where, as you can see, guard are stationed behind me after a suspected arson attack on a, an abandoned nursing home that was due to house migrants last night. Now, this is one of more than a dozen such arson attacks that have happened in Ireland over the past year. The Irish state has taken in more refugees than it can house forcing the government to offer asylum applicants tents and sleeping bags as they arrived in Dublin. Since the Russian invasion, nearly 100,000 Ukrainians have been offered refuge in Ireland. I spoke to one Ukrainian refugee outside of an asylum processing centre in Dublin. You've lived in a tent here for a month. Yeah. And how's that been? Well, you know, like, uh, for me it was uh, better to stay, stay here because no bombs, no military. I don't live here. Okay. I have I have accommodation for like seven months or something, and now I have right to work. I had, I received this labor market market access. I start to uh, work, and uh, well, I believe in a month or two I I will be able to rent something. And how have the Irish people been? Have they been welcoming? Irish people are different. Like uh, in this area, Irish people were very very kind really very kind it's it's not the, that city center that we were spire and all that chunky people and all that here it was very quiet and like welcoming place 
Excluding Ukrainians, the number of asylum seekers arriving into Ireland has shot up to more than 26,000 over the past two years, a growth of nearly 200% from 2019. To find out more about the surge in refugees coming to Ireland, I spoke to Jim O'Callaghan, an Irish lawmaker from one of the governing parties. So speaking to people in Ross Grey and other parts of rural Ireland, uh, as well as Dublin, people are concerned about unvetted single males entering the country. Um, do you think that's a valid concern? Well, I can understand people's concerns, but when people come in, there's a, there's a rules-based system that operates in Ireland. And I think one of the failures that maybe we have, as government have and previous governments have had is we don't explain the system to people. And obviously the issue that's been looked at at present is the international protection system. This derives from an EU directive. We transposed it into Irish law and the uh, International Protection Act 2015. And listen, it provides that a minister can remove a person who's applying for international protection if that person is perceived as being a threat. And obviously individuals come in as well, they're fingerprinted. Anyone who has convictions or is perceived as being a threat can be removed. But you're, you're right, some people are very concerned about the fact that what's referred to as unvetted men are moving into their area. But I think we need to explain that that's not the case because when you look at the system that's in place, there are powers in place for the minister to remove people who are dangerous or who are a threat. Now we're hearing a similar story in places like Ross Grey and elsewhere about the government doing a sort of backdoor deal with a hotel or a business to house asylum seekers and not telling the local community or consulting with the local community in advance. People feel like they're not in control of the future of their community and their livelihoods. What would you say to people who have those concerns? Well, listen, it's a difficult uh, issue for all concerned. Obviously, because of the significant numbers that have come in in the past year, government must provide sheltered accommodation for people who are seeking international protection. That's our obligation we're finding it difficult to do it. Like, there's no point in pretending that we're not finding it difficult to do. And of course, the reason for that is because in 2022, 140,000 people come in. We've seen 100,000 uh, Ukrainians, and there's more people coming in. And in terms of the international protection applicants, we have an obligation as well to provide them with sheltered accommodation. So one of the reason, this is new for Ireland, so the government is going around trying to find alternative accommodation. And that's why units such as hotels are being looked at or old nursing homes. And yeah, you're right, it does cause concern in the local community, particularly if it's the only hotel in the town. But also I've got to say too, there's lots of other places in my constituency and throughout the country where people have come in and there haven't been objections. Dara O'Brien. There are some TDs who have spoken out against immigration in the Irish Parliament. Six of them have formed a loose coalition called the Rural Independent Group. I sat down with one of their members, Carol Nolan, to hear their side of the story. Well, look, I have never seen the feeling as strong. I've been elected since 2016 to the Dáil, and I have never seen the feeling as strong on the ground on that particular issue as it is on the issue of immigration. I do feel that people will, will protest at the ballot box, and I do feel that if government don't change direc direction quickly, as I've stated before, that they will be punished. And I do believe that you will see more independent candidates and more candidates that are of the view that we are all at an unsustainable level of immigration. I believe that that's the representation that people want. Do you think immigration is fueling anti-EU sentiments in Ireland? It certainly is, yes, it certainly is. Um, people feel, like, like myself, look, I'm frustrated. I believe there's more government could do in terms of pushing back, like Hungary has pushed back and as I say Poland and other countries. There's more they could do. I believe that they have a responsibility to represent the Irish people. They're not doing so at EU level. But there is a, a lot of frustration over EU dictating um, the, you know, everything that a country should do, including the numbers that they should take in and, and so forth. So there, are, there is definitely frustration. Over, over that dictatorship as people, some people see it. And you read a lot about the far right in Ireland, especially in recent years. Is there a far right in Ireland and what does it look like? I, I, I don't believe, look, there may be a very small element. Um, being honest, I haven't met anybody who is far right. I've met grandparents coming into my office. I've met people from other countries 
Um, I have a good friend from Turkey and she's expressed concern over the numbers coming in. I have good friends from all over the world. They're not far right. Um, I, I haven't, but I look, that's not to say there isn't an element there. Um, of course, in these situations, in these conditions, you will get elements that, that will come up overnight, like far right, as it has done across Europe. Leo Varadkar's government says it can tackle the problems around immigration with better messaging and tougher laws to censor what it deems as hate speech. But the Irish public say their concerns are legitimate, a view which is becoming harder to ignore as it gains political momentum. It's beginning to look like the Irish government's vision of an Ireland which looks more like its European neighbours is coming true, a multicultural country ripe for populist revolt. I can't go holding You won't put it. All of you, yeah? That's not enough. Where's the man? Where's the man? Where's the man? 